Uh, so I'm here at Snorkel AI, uh, kind of representing product today. I'm a former Java developer myself with a focus on distributed systems. And then eventually I transitioned uh, due to an interest on the product side of databases in particular, and more recently diving deep into the product side of AI. Haley? Perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley. I am a machine learning solutions engineer here at Snorkel. I uh, have been working in machine learning for, uh, I guess, a few years now. Also did my like undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, but I guess beyond uh, interest in machine learning, I also uh, am deeply passionate about like AI education and teaching. So I'm excited to kind of walk through the demo today. Um, I actually wanted to start up front you know, with some of the key takeaways or how I would say is, you know, what are we here for? Um, in terms of RAG, you know, it, and this applies broader to AI in general, specialization is ultimately needed, right? When we're looking at the models and the frameworks and the components, you know, these are all intended to operate in generalized environment, right? They're fantastic if we want to ask it simple, common questions. They're not as effective when we get into more, you know, domain specific environments, you know, particularly if the tasks become increasingly complex. So there's always some degree of specialization is needed. More specifically around RAG, you know, whether or not responses are acceptable depends entirely on whether or not the context is correct and complete. Uh, and lastly, this is ultimately needed to help us get to production, right? So we can start with, you know, an out of the box RAG pipeline. Uh, we may see accuracy that spans anywhere from 25% to 50%. Uh, this helps us get started with a POC. We can demonstrate that there's value here, that we can make this work. But ultimately, if you're trying to get to 75, 85, 95% accuracy, you know, a degree of optimization is going to be required there. In terms of how we optimize reg pipelines, uh, three basic areas that we're going to touch on today. The first is improving chunking correctness, right? Given a very large PDF document, um, how can we properly chunk it uh, into smaller pieces that are whole uh, and relevant? The second one is improving the retrieval accuracy, right? So given that we've chunked hundreds, maybe thousands, you know, tens of thousands of documents, and we have a, a massive you know, library of chunks, uh, how can we ensure that we are identifying and retrieving only the most relevant ones for a specific question? And the last one is improving the context window utilization, right? So we have context of window available to us. How can we best fill it with relevant information to make sure that we get a great response? And finally, all of this comes down to data in one shape or form or another. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that today as well. We'll certainly see a lot more of this with Haley's demo. So what do we need to get started at optimizing a reg pipeline? As I just mentioned, it's labeled data, right? Arguably it's the API for LLMs, right? Whether we're looking at optimizing retrieval, generation, uh, performing an evaluation, these things are ultimately broken down into different tasks, whether we're trying to fine tune a model, uh, we're trying to evaluate responses, we're trying to fine tune you know, indexing. We need labeled data and more specifically need we high quality curated data. Um, so very much this is a quality over quantity scenario. Um, it's not necessarily about having 100,000 data points, but maybe having as a few as 1,000 really great data points uh, can be highly effective. That being said, the focus for today's webinar, of course, is on retrieval. Uh, so we're taking a, a strong look at embedding and indexing you know, as it relates to uh, improving our context and ultimately our responses. And the examples there, labeled prop context pairs, we'll dive into this a little bit more, and labeled documents. Right? These are the means by which we can curate that data necessary to optimize retrieval. So how do we do it? I'm going to start with you kind of a, a very simple, you know, kind of flow here. And there's two phases to it. The first is pre-retrieval, right? So we have a document. We need to break that document into smaller chunks. And then for each of those chunks, we'll create an embedding. And then we will 
pair that chunk with that embedding and we'll index it into a vector store. This is kind of before uh, we're even prompting and interacting. Then there's actually the retrieval steps, right? We receive the prompt, we will generate an embedding from that prompt. We'll use it to retrieve relevant chunks, and then we'll set the context and, of course, pass that on to the LLM. And so this is kind of a high-level view of our RAG pipelines and kind of how we would break it into pre-retrieval and retrieval. If I were to go into a little bit more detail and kind of start to map out this flow a little bit, uh, we have our documents. Right, we're gonna break those on the chunks. Uh, we're gonna feed those through an embedding model. We're gonna pair the chunk with the embedding. We're gonna store it in a vector store. When a prompt arrives, we'll generate an embedding from that prompt, right? We'll pass that to the vector store to give back the relevant chunks, attach our prompt, forward that over to the LLM to generate our response. In terms of where we can optimize, there's three areas we'll discuss today. One of them is in pre-retrieval, one of them is a retrieval, and of course that embedding model kind of sits in the, in the middle uh, and plays in both spaces. So we'll talk about how we can better optimize you know, document chunking and what that means. Hmm. And we'll talk about how we can fine tune the embedding model uh, so that it does a better job of returning you know, the most relevant or the most correct chunks. And of course, we'll talk about how we can optimize usage of that context window to make sure that we're getting the most out of it. So we'll start with chunking optimization. And for what it's worth, uh, we'll go through this flow linearly just to just describe. So start with chunking. Why it's important, ultimately it's not the documents that are added to the prompt and passed to the LLM as context, it's chunks, right? It's smaller pieces of those documents. So those are what we would describe as the units of information that we're indexing and retrieving and ultimately passing to the model. Uh, the challenges here is that if you have, you know, I'd say incorrect or illogical boundaries, they're going to have an impact on the embeddings and the scores generated by those embeddings. Uh, for example, if our chunks are too big, they're including irrelevant context. So our score, our relevancy score is ultimately going to come down. Um, if they're too small, they're lacking relevant context, right? Which is really important to us. Um, and so our score is ultimately coming down. And so you want to have an eye for, you know, how can we you know, appropriately break a document into chunks? And there's two notions to this. Uh, fixed versus dynamic, you know, I think this is closer to what you would see in a default out-of-the-box setup. You might say that I want to create chunks of 512 tokens. Uh, and it doesn't matter where that breakpoint is, uh, although certainly we can introduce some overlap. Or there's a concept of dynamic, right? Not every chunk has to be the same size. Some may be smaller, some may be larger, uh, depending on the information within that chunk. The other aspect is this notion of physical versus semantic. Uh, so if you and I were looking at a document and we are asked to break it apart, we would do it logically based on the structure of that document, right? The information that's contained within it. Uh, versus a more basic approach doesn't necessarily pay attention to start to the you know the headers, uh, the section titles. It's just arbitrarily, you know, cutting it and slicing it and dicing it. Uh, so what we have at Snorkel is a more adaptive approach, uh, and I'll talk about that here next. The idea is we will actually look at the structure of a document, right? Understand the notion of tables. Uh, and other maybe not normal you know, language like sentences. Uh, those section headings, uh, those titles, we will use those to better understand how we should chunk that document. And it might mean that if there's a section with two paragraphs, that chunk might be a little bit longer because it's not worth breaking apart those two paragraphs, right? They're highly correlated. Uh, they're both needed you know, to answer a question. But what you see on the right, uh, is essentially an evaluation of that, right? So in the upper document, those orange lines, those are kind of the breakpoints, right? Those are the real separation uh, between articles, for example, in a big document. Uh, and then our inferred chunking on the bottom essentially mirrors that, right? So in the same way that um, you and I would understand where to you know, add breakpoints on the document, 
uh, snorkel adaptive chunking is able to do the same thing, right? So the, the chunking is natural uh, instead of crude or forced. And ultimately it ends up improving the answers from LLMs, right? You can see 20 to 30 point lift uh, with kind of basic questioning answering, uh, 10 to point lift, you know, content, you know, in comparison to other semantic approaches that you might see out there. Um, so this is key to us making sure that we are correctly chunking documents so that the right ones are ultimately chosen and fill up that context window. And to kind of give some examples here, uh, looking at some healthcare plans, this would be the result of default uh, or, or basic chunking, right? I think this is 512 tokens uh, with a small amount of overlap. And so you see the kind of these blue spots are where you know chunks had been extracted. But we can quickly see this is not a very good approach, right? In that first one, uh, we have the last bit you know, of the previous section, uh, a title, and then just you know 80% you know, of the next section. A little bit in the second example there. And then in the third example, we completely missed you know, the title and the opening sentence within that section. Uh, so we're already seeing that, you know, if I ask a question, maybe it's about, you know, notification of change in status. Uh, that chunk in the middle is already going to be missing, you know, some aspects of it. That's going to weaken that relevancy score when I'm asking questions. On the other hand, with snorkel adaptive chunking, this is looking much more logical, right? So kind of the first one entire, you know, sentence, the supporting bullets, and the second one, just that entire section, right? Regardless of length or um, paragraph breakpoints, they're all together. Uh, and the same thing in the third, right? And they include those titles. So we're doing a better job of breaking these health insurance documents into relevant sections that are gonna be helpful in answering questions. One little bit here that we didn't touch on in the very beginning is at Snorkel, we also have kind of an extra step around document enrichment. Um, so this is something you wouldn't normally see if you were Googling for uh, RAG pipelines and you're looking for architectural images, you probably wouldn't see this step. Um, this is something that we're doing and we're finding great results with our customers is we're trying to extract metadata from their documents because that can ultimately help us when it comes time to retrieving the right chunks for context. Uh, but there are other side benefits as well, right? We're going to create more training data, which we can use in multiple places. Uh, but ultimately what this means is we can be even more accurate in retrieving the correct chunks, right? When we're trying to set our context. And there's two pieces here, and I'll show a little example here in a minute. Uh, one of them is classification, right? So can we begin to classify these documents to better help find the right ones we're looking for? Or can we use information within those documents and then extract it um, to add additional metadata, right? Think of it more like tagging uh, or adding keywords, but doing this uh, programmatically, you know, and based on the data. So what it looks like in practice, and I grabbed one of these healthcare plans here, um, those first two would be, you know, notions of that information extraction or what we'll refer to as concept classifiers. Uh, so we might be able to create labeling functions that, for example, look for ranges, right? So if you see a number such as 30 followed by um, or duration such as days or weeks or months, uh, we know that this is a time period, right? So if we're trying to find documents and what's really important to us is understanding what the time period is um, between plans or how long you have to you know, change a plan um, or enroll in a new plan when you change jobs, you know, these things are going to help us find great chunks um, or individual HMO, right? So we can find that this is a plan type. So we're looking for any document that is specific to, you know, a plan type. Uh, those last three are examples of the structural extraction, right? So we can look uh, within these documents, identify titles, um, sections, subheadings, and then we can also use those to generate labels for our documents. Uh, so in this very simple example here, given a large batch of health insurance uh, plans and descriptions and documents, we can add labels to those documents that tell us if they contain things like the plan type or time periods or effective dates. Um, all this can 
help us be, I'd say, not only more effective, more, but more efficient when we're trying to retrieve the right chunks later on in the retrieval process. The next big one is the embedding model, right? So this is kind of the piece that ties together pre-retrieval and retrieval. And the purpose ultimately is to help us find the right chunks by scoring them, right? So the idea is we will take the prompt, uh, then we'll look at the context, how similar are they, right? If they're very, very similar, they have a high score. If they're not very similar, it's a low score. And of course, we just want the high scoring results coming back. The challenge here is that pre-trained embedding models, you know, just like foundation models, and if we're talking about LLMs more specifically, um, are generalized, right? So they're very good at, you know, helping us identify similarity across a very, very broad spectrum of topics. Uh, where they struggle is to understand what's similar and dissimilar in a very narrow topic, right? So if we have a specific domain, such as finance or healthcare or retail, a pre-trained embedding model would think everything in finance is similar, right? Because finance is very different from retail and healthcare. But if we're building a co-pilot, right, or an assistant at a bank, uh, we're not concerned about anything outside the world of finance. And within that world, we have to understand that things uh, can be nuanced and might be very, very dissimilar. And so with fine tuning, the idea is we'll take related chunks, and we will move them closer together in the embedding space. And then for unrelated chunks, we'll move them farther apart, right? So in a sense, um, it's almost like, you know, puzzle pieces on a board, right? We're shifting everything around, but ultimately that's to help us uh, better find what we're looking for. In terms of how it's done, I mean, you have to start with a pre-trained embedding model. Um, the MTB benchmark is a great place. Uh, take a look and see who is leading, right? Try a few yourself, find which one's kind of working best out of the box. Um, and then you're gonna have to do some evaluation, right? And find out how well is this model differentiating between relevant and irrelevant chunks, right? How much of a gap is there uh, between how well it's performing and how well I need it to perform if I want to get to production. Uh, and then once you understand that, you can start the fine tuning process and you can improve the accuracy of that embedding model. Now, a couple of visuals to help explain what I was just discussing. You know, on the left, if we were looking at a pre-trained model, um, you can see there's a cluster of financial concepts. There's a cluster around health. Uh, if we were to fill this in, there might be a cluster around retail, a cluster around pop culture. Uh, but if I'm a bank, you know, my focus is on the financial concepts. And I need my model to understand that these can be very, very different, right? A, a Roth ROA is not the same as a 401k, right? If I'm looking for savings accounts, I don't want it to be grouped with information around IRAs or 401ks. Um, so you can imagine that we're kind of zooming in to what's relevant to our domain uh, and then pushing things further or closer apart, you know, while we're zoomed in. Um, so that when we get our prompt embeddings, uh, we can ensure that we are getting the best chunks returned, right? The most relevant chunks. And another example here, you know, in terms of what happens in impact, uh, given a prompt on the left, we can see that there's a lot of overlap between the relevant and non-relevant chunks, right? If I were to pick a marker such as, you know, say 50% for my cosine similarity, um, I am going to get relevant chunks. I'm also going to get a whole lot of non-relevant chunks. Um, so this overlap is what we're trying to remove by fine tuning the embedding model. Um, the result is what you see on the right. Uh, so the benefit is not only can I eliminate you know, the irrelevant context, but I can actually raise the threshold for my score. And so on the right side, if I were to set my score at say 75, um, I'm virtually guaranteed to get all of the most relevant context and I won't have any noise uh, that's caused by irrelevant context. Um, so it really does matter in practice. And here's another example of looking at it. Um, what you see on the left in a pre-trained model, again, you know, everything's clustered really closely, right? When we're trying to find the chunks for a, a particular prompt. Um, and certainly if I set my threshold at 75, you can see I'm probably gonna get maybe 40%, you know, of the irrelevant chunks. 
Um, although, yes, maybe a little bit higher, maybe 80 percent, you know, the relevant chunks, um, still kind of a mixed bag. But on the right, um, if I th set my threshold at 75, you know, keep it the same, I'm almost guaranteed to basically get all the most relevant context now. Right. Um, and as I had said in the very beginning, the better the context, the better the response is. Right. So as we are trying to limit the number of chunks because we only want what's relevant, right? The more noise you add, the harder time the model has interpreting it and generating the answer that you're looking for. Um, so this process helps us narrow down and kind of optimize uh, the chunks that are retrieved to only what we need and the very best that's available to us. The last part here, context window optimization. So given a context window, and yes, those context windows are continuing to grow and, and some of them are very large, but some things to keep in mind is that the more you add, the more impact it can have on performance. You know, whether that's simply latency, right? How much time does it take the model to, you know, interpret a million tokens uh, versus 1,000 tokens? Um, and it can be noisier, right? You might fill it with, you know, as many tokens as possible, but if only 20% of those tokens are really relevant, uh, you're just creating noise. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you're trying to keep your context as small as possible, well, maybe that's because we want to keep costs down too, um, there's a risk of missing, you know, useful or maybe even needed information that should have been in that context. Um, so there is kind of this balance between precision, precision and recall, uh, but hopefully at the end of the day, is we want to identify the chunks with the highest relevance, right? That's what the scores are there for, um, and consider the context window size that's available to us. So in this small little example, uh, we have a context window. You know, let's say we're getting, you know, ten chunks returned. Uh, we know that you know half of them uh, are, are very high scoring. Uh, sometimes what happens is if you're looking at you know, kind of out of the box rag pipelines, you know, and frameworks and default configurations, you might have something where it's just set to a fixed number, right? I don't care what model you're using. I don't care how big the context window is. Let's always take the top three chunks based on the relevant score. Um, so on one hand, yes, you know, you're, you're not overdoing it, right? By adding too much noise, but you know, you're probably missing uh, relevant information. So the idea is to, yes, we want to score those and we want to rank those, but then let's choose as many of the high scoring ones as we can, right? Um, and you kind of have to thread threshold for that. What does that mean to be low scoring or high scoring? If we recall the diagrams I was just looking at a minute ago, um, those can be helpful, right? So when I looked at one of those, it appeared that, you know, anywhere around 75, 80 uh, was a fantastic threshold, right? That was kind of ensuring that almost everything was you know, a relevant uh, and highly useful chunk. So fill up the window, uh, but fill it up the window wisely and with the right chunks. The final piece here, and then we'll transition to Haley in just a moment to kind of dive deeper into Snorkel Flow, uh, is AI data development. And so the very beginning here, we mentioned that when it comes to you know, specializing models, optimizing reg pipelines, you know, evaluating them, it all comes down to data in one shape or form or another. And that's why Snorkel Flow exists, right? This is a platform that's been designed to help, you know, subject matter experts and data scientists collaborate to curate data that we need to improve, you know, our AI applications. So two kind of core pieces here. Um, is the documents, right? So adding our documents, extracting structural information, right? The titles, uh, the headers, uh, subheaders, sections, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, creating those concept classifiers I mentioned, right? So extracting, maybe I won't say extracting, but maybe looking uh, for certain, you know, text, right? Or structure that we can use to add metadata. Right. So if things have those spans like 30 days, 30 weeks, uh, we're looking for stuff like dollar amounts, right? $200, $300. This is probably a copay. Uh, adding those things, creating that metadata, which I'll ultimately use a little bit later in chunk retrieval. And then adding your prompt and chunk pairs. 
uh, and using those to create that high quality training data we need to make sure that our embedding model is performing accurately. And kind of the short flow here is typically, you know, we'd start with SMEs, right? And have our subject matter experts label a subset uh, of those pairs as relevant or irrelevant. Uh, so we're trying to establish some ground truth here. You know, it may simply be a hundred pairs uh, to help us get started. Then we can also go a little bit farther, you know, if we're short on data, for example, and we can create labeling functions to generate questions from chunks, right? Probably should put chunks there instead of context. Uh, but for each of these chunks, we can send that chunk to, you know, for example, uh, ChatGPT and say, hey, based on this chunk, you know, what are one or more questions uh, that would be answered by the information in it? Um, so that can help us kind of generate synthetic prompt chunk pairs but ones that are gonna be relevant. Uh, and then finally, data scientists, for example, can create additional labeling functions that will pragmatically label the remaining pairs, right? So if we had started with say, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 uh, prompt chunk pairs, we had the SMEs label 100 to help us with ground truth. Uh, we might've used uh, you know, an LLM to help us generate some synthetic uh, prompt chunk pairs to kind of increase, uh, I'd say both the diversity, right, uh, in the range. And then we would use those labeling functions to pragmatically label, you know, the other 9,999, because it's not practical to ask an SME to identify the appropriate context for 10,000 questions, right? Um, or to put, you know, those prompt chunk pairs in front of them and say, look at all 10,000 of these, tell me which ones are correct and, and which ones are not. Um, so that's the whole point behind these labeling functions is that we can scale that knowledge. So once we understand the logic that our SMEs are using to determine whether the context is relevant or not, we can encapsulate that knowledge in these labeling functions and we can apply them very broadly. And so kind of touch on this one more time, you know, do you rely on your SMEs to help get started? Um, although I would probably say maybe a step zero here uh, might be a byproduct of evaluation. So if you have your RAG pipeline up and running, you're probably going to want to do some evaluation to understand what's your baseline, right? Is it 25% accurate? Is it 50% accurate? Uh, so maybe you pass it through, you know, somewhere between 1,000, 10,000 props, right? Capture the context, uh, although more specifically, capture the chunks uh, that are being retrieved for those props. Um, that can kind of serve, you know, as our starter material. Um, and then given that starter material, have the SMEs look at a sample of it um, and help identify you know, what's relevant, what's not. We'll use this as ground truth uh, so that we can see how well we're doing a little bit later. And then kind of collaborating with those SMEs is help understand what goes into deciding whether the context is relevant or not. Um, and then we can use all the things that we kind of talked about earlier from the metadata to the, you know, different labeling functions and all of a sudden within a day uh, versus weeks or months, you can actually have 10,000 labeled prompt chunk pairs, right? And you're ready to start fine tuning your embedding model. Um, but if you're still short, right? Maybe it's not practical to start with 10,000 prompt chunk pairs. Um, as long as we've you know, worked on the documents, right? Put them in a vector store, we've generated the chunks. Uh, we can use an LLM to kind of go through all those available chunks, you know, or at least a subset of those and generate questions for us, right? So we can synthetically generate uh, enough data to help us, like I said, reach that point of completeness and diversity. Although the other thing um, not specifically listed here is hard negatives. Uh, so what can be really, really helpful when it comes to fine tuning your embedding model is giving examples that you know, would be challenging for a person but virtually impossible for the model, right? Because you know we might have a prompt and a chunk that look very, very similar, uh, but there's a certain amount of nuance involved um, where the differences are subtle. So our SMEs can tell um, that this isn't relevant, though without training the model could it, right? It, it thinks these things are virtually identical. Um, so not only are we trying to understand you know good examples, bad examples, uh, but in terms of those bad examples, find the ones that otherwise look like they should be relevant, but truly deeply aren't. Um, and that can have a big impact on the model.
The other thing I wanted to note here is that the data you're working with also depends on the loss functions that you're going to use to train the embedding model or vice versa, right? Depending on your starting point. Um, so I kind of highlighted the bottom four examples there when we were talking about AI data development um, and the SMEs, one option was to simply state whether a prompt chunk pair was relevant or irrelevant. Um, so that's kind of like your second row there, right? So we have our anchor, which is our prompt, and then we have either a positive or negative chunk, right? And we'll look to the SME to say that. Uh, there are different variations of it though. Um, you might have a prompt and a context and actually have a score, right? Say a range from zero to 1.0. Uh, you might also have the triplets, right? Where for a given prompt, we have both a relevant chunk and an irrelevant chunk, right? So we can help the model better understand that when someone asks a certain question, here's the types of chunks that are gonna be helpful. Here's the ones that are not going to be very helpful. So I think this is worth keeping in mind uh, as you go into that AI data development process uh, and what the role is of the SMEs and the labeling functions, because we can do all of these, right? We could do labeling functions to mark them as positive or negative. We could do labeling functions to assign them uh, a similarity score. Uh, we can even choose to work with triplets. Um, so that part's up to you. So with that said, um, I know I moved through a, probably a fair amount of material very quickly here, but I do want to save time for Haley uh, to kind of walk us through snorkel flow, show us what some of what I just described is done in practice. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a great overview. And with that, I will start off the demo with a, a few more slides, just kind of like providing context over like over what we're going to uh, see in the snorkel flow platform today. Today's demo, uh, as we kind of mentioned, we're going to look at diagnosing and optimizing your LLM systems using snorkel. And uh, this presentation is for teams who have gotten some work done on LLM systems, but aren't quite seeing production ready results and are trying to close that gap. And uh, today's presentation will be talking about closing that gap in the realm of retrieval. So what you might have tried as a POC is backing up some of your documents to some state-of-the-art model. So here's an example of uh, a team we worked with from a top 10 US bank that was attempting to build an LLM system on CLO documents. So these are documents that are, for the most part, would not be included in a training index for LLMs. And using Llama Index and GBT4, the bank was able to get about 25% accuracy rate on those default settings. And a lot of that is due to the very domain specific and dense information within these documents. And so this was enough to show that there's some potential here, but obviously there's a pretty big gap into getting it into production. Using Snorkel, they were actually able to get up to 89% accuracy in just about five weeks. And so today we're gonna to be taking a look into some of those techniques and tools that we use to uh, diagnose and tune this system. Uh, many of which uh, Shane was mentioning uh, before in the first half of the webinar. So now that we can see how to, we can use Snorkel to build out systems that are ready for production. And in the demo today, we won't necessarily be doing a uh, banking chatbot, but instead we're going to be taking on uh, the hat and uh, we're going to be working at a company called Shield Healthcare that is working to build a co-pilot over health insurance policy documents. So this co-pilot is designed to save our customer service agents time by automatically getting and generating answers for uh, them being able to respond to customers in real time uh, about comparisons between policies or information about out-of-pocket coverage. And so it's incredibly important that this copilot is very grounded and generating correct answers to give back to the users. And we're actually gonna start out in our pre-production environment where we were noticing some odd behavior with the existing version of our copilot. Even before jumping into that, I can uh, give a very high level overview and kind of share the uh, open source documents that we built this application off of. So this application was built off of uh, benefit health uh, documents from a number of different companies that we were able to pull uh, open source. And we can see that each of these PDFs, they contain a lot of that benefit information that we want to pull from, but all the different benefit document PDFs differ in uh, structure as well as maybe like the way they put data into tables or different paragraphs and categories. And so this is kind of that backing of all the different documents that we use to pull and retrieve from. 
But now that we've kind of seen these documents, we can jump into our pre-production environment. So this is just a Gradio application that I built out to be able to kind of showcase how the model is performing. Uh, maybe before we put it into production, we want to run some testing on it. And so here we can see for many questions, our model is performing very well. And so this is one that as a domain expert, I understand that this is the accurate response that I'm looking to get, as well as a very brief and easy response for my uh, end users to read and take uh, note of and deliver back to a customer. However, for many other questions, our copilot does not seem to be performing necessarily the way that we want. And so here we can see that this is typically correct. So a like out of net network test is typically higher than an in network test. What we're really looking for is kind of those uh, numeric values or like the ability to uh, have like a more specific and specified answer back to the users. And then finally, for other questions, we're seeing that our copilot is just abstaining from uh, answering the re or responding, saying that it's not available within those documents. But as a domain expert, I actually do know that this should be in the document and is. It just is not finding it correctly when it's actively retrieving. And so this is one of, one of the main ways in which teams will start to realize that they actually have an error in retrieval is just that GPT-4 or whatever model uh, you're using is abstaining from answering your questions. But to uh, kind of my uh, hypothesis in that, but the next step really to dive a bit deeper is to actually onboard a subset of our data into Snorkel Flow. And so here in the Snorkel Flow manual annotation platform, teams can start to uh, do that first step of human in the loop evaluation to really diagnose where the errors are coming from. So here we can assign a subset of our domain experts to help us evaluate the quality of our large language models and the quality of the context that's being retrieved, uh, really letting us know which area in the system we need to diagnose and iterate on to improve performance. So uh, on the left-hand side here, kind of orienting ourselves with the screen, we can see that we're able to pull in things for users to look at, such as the prompt that was added in, like so the user's question, the LLM response, as well as the retrieved context that's being pulled. Uh, and then here on the right-hand side, we can see a very simple uh, thumbs up, thumbs down label schema for each of our two core error modes that we wanna diagnose. However, you can imagine that everything brought to, into this page is fully customizable from the amount of information that you want to show your users. So if you have any other metadata or columns that would be helpful for them when making their uh, diagnosis to also the, the specific like either like company specific or domain specific, however you'd like to do this like label schema ranking for uh, like good or bad performance. And so this can be beyond this binary one to the multi-class or even multi-label like classification problem. It can be uh, like also even like some teams will use like sequence tagging or uh, even free text label schemas to have users write in what maybe the correct answer would be. All of this is fully customizable for how you want to do your evaluation with your domain experts. But as a domain expert in Snorkel, I uh, am presented with this very simple view, and now I can start to provide my feedback of how the copilot should be working for me uh, to be able to like answer these questions better. And so kind of going through this, maybe I can kind of start to look at my prompt and say uh, it's abstaining from answering. And uh, so that seems to be the correct response because it actually doesn't have any of that information in my retrieved context. But my retrieved context is wrong because it seems to be pulling in information maybe around this like table of contents of my benefit plan. And then another key thing in Snorkel is that because we're a unified data development platform with this first workflow being for the subject matter experts and the second one being for the data scientists that all lives in one centralized location, teams can take advantage of uh, a number of measures within Snorkel to really help that communication back and forth. So beyond even just giving back my signal as a domain expert of my accept and reject, I can also add in these comments and tags to say that this is kind of a trend I've been seeing in the documents that we're pulling in the table of contents and even uh, like maybe even describe it more thoroughly by adding in a comment to say that the context is being pulled in at the table of contents. And then as I go through, maybe I'm starting to see a lot more of the same uh, 
examples here where I can see that this question about acupuncture, it seems like it says acupuncture, but it's almost the end of that section. So it's like, I almost want to imagine that it might be the chunk above that has more information about this acupuncture. And so I can also kind of describe that back to my data scientist to really drive value from it. So after going through a series of manual annotations, it's kind of the first guideline system that we uh, tell users to do is to kind of diagnose and baseline your system's errors. Typically we'll bucket into two groups. The first being those like retrieval based errors or generation based errors. In this example, we kind of had our domain experts go through and found that most of our errors are really happening in the retrieval side. And so what happens next in uh, RAG enrichment within Snorkel? So there are really three core ways in which Snorkel has partnered with teams looking to tackle this problem in retrieval. Shane talked a great high level overview of uh, all three of them. In today's demo, we'll actually be focusing uh, the most on this third group of improving retrieval through embedding model fine tuning. But we do have like previous demos and other uh, webinars and resources to kind of go through the other two in that technical realm. So let's stop, let's step back for a second and uh, think about what, why this might happen. So why we might need to fine tune this embedding model. So these large embedding models and large language models are used for very general problems. So they have information and understanding about a lot of different topics. So the embedding model that we're using to embed something like this of Oppenheimer One Best Picture, it's also going to be able to embed and understand things about uh, that last question we just looked at of is ac acupuncture being treated by a physician's visit? So these are very different topics and they have a lot of distance between them. And so we ask a question like, is acup acupuncture covered by my plan? It's it's pretty intuitive to see that this question would land closer to this other information about acupuncture in the table of contents than uh, this question about Oppenheimer. However, since these are very domain-specific documents, everything within these documents tend to clump together in a general knowledge setting. So one thing that we want to be able to see is to be able to move that table of contents away from our other pieces of information about acupuncture. So the goal for, for uh, fine tuning and your embedding model is to decrease this distance between the question and the relevant chunk. And we can see that here. And this uh, increase of the distance between the question and the irrelevant information, uh, this is where an embedding model tuned on your domain specific data is going to far perform an out of the box uh, embedding model. So the way that we're gonna do this in Snorkel is by actually creating these pairs of questions and relevant chunks for our data. So we can feed that information into a fine tuning system where we can create a custom embedding model that understands our, beta, our data better. And so we're gonna be able to do this programmatically at scale. So instead of having to manually have your annotators go through and find every question and context pair, we're going to use programmatic labeling to be able to do this uh, at scale for all of your data and to really curate that best data set for your fine tuning. And so there are two ways and two steps that we'll do this within the demo and quickly showcase. And so this first technique, we'll be looking at taking questions from our chatbot so we know where we're struggling to retrieve the correct information. And we're gonna annotate these chunks of our document to create these relevant question context pairs that will ultimately go back into the embedding model. To do that, uh, we will actually be pulling our data into Snorkel Flow. So we can uh, see that we've brought our documents here and we are going to programmatically label parts of these documents that are relevant and irrelevant for a handful of key questions. So essentially labeling each question for its relevant chunk. So Snorkel Flow enables teams to label this data programmatically by writing labeling functions that can be applied programmatically at scale to all of your unlabeled documents. So you can look at these different functions as a way to codify the reasoning behind why domain experts for the, uh, are choosing each different chunk to be related to each question. And a key thing about these uh, programmatic labels, as we kind of already talked about how all the PDFs have different structures, is that they do not need to be perfect. Uh, instead, underneath the hood, what Snorkel is going to do is denoise and take in these uh, different and oftentimes even conflicting sources of signals into the correct probabilistic labels. And so here, kind of going through the process of uh, finding an example of how we might evaluate this, we can see that for one of our key error modes that we noticed was our co-pilot really retrieving this table of contents information. And so from here, we might want to codify what makes something uh, a table of contents so that we can tag that as other. And so one thing that we're noticing is all of these chunks that are related to table of contents have this uh, 
really long pattern of dots. We can start to preview that labeling function. We're tagging that in as a table of contents. Another one that we might want to look at uh, as well would be uh, using actually our table of contents to kind of dive deeper into uh, being able to take in this like contextual information of where you would uh, search for different values within the document. So a key value of working with PDF documents is Snorkel, is Snorkel's ability to read in PDFs as this rich text format. So being able to actually understand the visual information of PDFs and when writing and creating labeling functions. So here we might say that, uh, say we're trying to tag a piece of information about whether or not you have been, or like what your coverage looks like when you're searching for a new job after being laid off. I know uh, just from key information that are like, just like understanding of laid off policies that uh, it would likely be looking for something underneath this COBRA section. And so with Snorkel Flow, we're able to create operators that can look at different uh, sections within your document. So now, right now, we're looking at for each of the different sections that have information uh, that are like actually stored underneath the pages that are related to the COBRA section of uh, a table of contents or any table of contents that say COBRA within it. And uh, this is something that we can add in as a labeling function within this document. And so to keep in mind in this part right now, we're not training a model just yet. We're actually just creating pairs of questions and relevant context so that when we uh, want to do that later at some point, we can just export our data and use it later in that fine tuning. The second step of this process was really being able to uh, filter out for high quality synthetic data that can also be added in to your fine tuning model. And so by using synthetic data over just the question context pairs that you might already have, you'll be able to generalize to new trends or dive deeper into new types of questions that might be asked uh, of your co-pilot in production. And so to do that, we've actually pulled in uh, some synthetic data within Snorkel Flow of questions of pairs and uh, generated responses. And we want to like create a model in the Snorkel Flow platform that will be looking at uh, whether or not this is a good idea of synthetic data. And so uh, to do this, uh, we've already been looking at some of the more keyword or regex-based uh, labeling functions. Uh, instead, we can also use more advanced labeling functions within the Snorkel Flow platform. And so here we can start to look at one that might be using a LLM or prompting it to uh, label our data at scale. So teams are able to connect to any LLM that they have access to and really prompt it to be able to ask whether or not that this would be a like, good or a bad example of synthetic data. Beyond even using LLMs, teams can also use our more uh, embedding-based approaches. And here we can start to uh, explore some of the different data that we're seeing here. And maybe I even look in on this segment and kind of start to see what these clusters might look like. And here we can see that these are all examples, again, of uh, some of these table of contents. And so these are ones in which we would want to reject and not use these in fine tuning our embedding model. After we have uh, both identified some good question uh, context pairs, as well as uh, used those in our data set for embedding model, or even uh, for like generating like more synthetic data of examples of what good questions and context pairs might be, or good question and responses might be, uh, we can move on to the next step. We'll actually be exporting our data. So we have our question content pairs ready for fine tuning. And so uh, in fine tuning our model, we can jump into a Jupyter notebook, which is actually embedded within Snorkel Flow. And here we can start to uh, actually run our uh, fine tuning. And so uh, we do have a native integration with Amazon SageMaker for fine tuning, and we can just call that within our SDK. And here are actually the examples that I wanted to showcase. So here we can see these graphs that are very similar to those different charts we were talking about before of uh, both how close your uh, question context pairs are. And so here we can see that uh, like before fine tuning, everything is very lumped together. We're irrelevant context as well as relevant context are really being pulled in in the same. And then after creating these processes in Snorkel Flow and programmatically curating our data, we were able to fine tune an embedding model that really has these uh, irrelevant context and relevant context uh, much more pushed apart uh, in practice. And so this is kind of what drives forward that uh, better embedding model for uh, retrieval. The key learnings is that the out-of-the-box RAG systems tend to fail, 
for these more domain specific tasks, we really have to do these data curate, this data curation, which can be scaled out programmatically. Yeah, just a, a quick recap of what we covered today, right? Um, specialization is almost always required to get, you know, LLM systems um, accurate enough for production when it comes to domain specific tasks, right? These are all built for generalization. And as you saw, you know, kind of in my slides, and then again, in Haley's demo with her charts, um, we need that specialization to help us drive more accurate responses in domain specific environments. Uh, it's all about improving the context, right? So the more accurate and relevant and complete uh, the information is contained within the context, the better the response we're going to get. Uh, and of course, optimization helps us meet those production requirements, right? It's the means by which we get from 25% accuracy to 95% accuracy. Uh, and then our three core areas, chunking, right? Doing that appropriately, logically, uh, improving retrieval accuracy so that we're only fetching the most relevant chunks. Uh, and then, of course, appropriately using that context window to fill it with highly relevant information. One last thing uh, before we turn over to Q&A is we do have an offer for a complimentary LLM um, slash RAG evaluation, right? So if you have uh, LLM deployed with or without a RAG pipeline, a Snorkel AI experts can perform uh, an evaluation of that model. Right, so we can actually do some of that AI data development that I talked about earlier and that Haley showed. And we can use that to create a report and help you understand how well your current RAG pipeline is or is not performing, um, along with where it may need additional improvement uh, versus where it may actually be doing pretty well, um, and recommendations for any steps that you can take to further improve that accuracy. Um, so there's a link here. Uh, please feel free to submit a request. We're always excited to find uh, new partners that we can connect with um, and kind of work on this LLM evaluation. And if you do want more information, we just had a webinar last week. Great. And lots of great questions um, in the Q&A, Shane. Um, let's see. I think one of the questions was around uh, chunking so we can point this over to Haley or Shane is the chunking fully automated or is there a way to manually adjust or fine tune at a high level um it's certainly automated right so we have code that will do that chunking for you uh, the degree to which you can tweak it or not I uh, might have to defer to Haley on that one but th this isn't a scenario though where you manually um choose your chunks right the the value in the snorkel adaptive chunking um, is that it does that for you. Yes, I think it's uh, very similar, though, uh, like tested against, I saw in some of the like QA, uh, it's been benchmarked against like the Llama Index semantic chunker, but uh, from my understanding of research, just work with it, it's very similar. Great. Um, there's a question here from Sundar, how do we fine tune? Is it, again, based on labeled data or is or for the specific domain area. Let's see. How do we fine tune? Is it again based off of labeled based off of labeled data for the specific domain area? Okay, I can take that. So uh, fine tuning will still be in uh, whatever structure of fine tuning like your team would like to do. So like I know that there are like a number of different techniques, but Snorkel's real value with it is being able to programmatically scale and programmatically curate the best examples to go into that fine tuning. So uh, it basically helps scale out that uh, manual need for labeling for that fine tuning process. So, um, and there's a question here from Michael about uh, the metadata. How exactly, how do you store the metadata extracted per chunk? Yeah, so uh, there are different ways to use the uh, metadata like enrichment within uh, building out models and systems. Like one way in which it's like when people will store it per chunk, uh, many like vector uh, databases or like embedding systems will have uh, the ability to tag in metadata. Uh, there's a generic question uh, here from Mike. Uh, the MTB from Hugging Face, uh, the leaderboard, how where do we see which model is designed for certain business contexts? It was mentioned uh, to use this one that's better for your domain, but I can't figure out where it says that. Um, so for those who haven't seen it before, here's the MTB leaderboard. Uh, what we had to mean by that is one, 
Uh, different embedding models can be um, better or worse depending on your task, right? So if you're building a solution around, um, say, summarization, uh, you might be looking for an embedding model that's been tuned to do really well uh, at summarization. Um, so there's depending on the different tasks you're working on. Uh, the other thing is you can simply try some of these with your data and get a baseline for how well they're working. Um, I think you saw BGE Small uh, in Haley's demo, uh, but there's lots of new ones always coming out. Um, this third one is actually from Salesforce. Um, this seventh one is from NVIDIA. Um, Grit uh, is popular. Google has one. Um, so there's quite a few out there, uh, but just as if we we're kind of the normal you know, generative model space, there's always new leaders, um, new approaches. So it's always worth uh, kind of keeping up with that uh, and seeing you know, what's going on. But yeah, I would click on these. Uh, you can generally kind of check out the model card and they'll give you some information you know, as to where it might be optimized, what it might be great for. Um, try that out with your data. And then depending on the results, you can determine how much fine tuning is going to be necessary to get it to where you want to be. Great. Well, with that, I see we are at time. Uh, so just, uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Haley and Shane, for the amazing presentation and taking all the questions. Uh, for folks who want to join for a future webinar or a live demo of SnorkelFlow, you can always find those at snorkel.ai slash uh, events. And as Shane mentioned, uh, we are offering that free custom uh, LLM eval, which I put a link into uh, the chat. And you can also find that on our website uh, right at the top of the homepage. So look forward to seeing everyone again at a future webinar event. Have a great rest of your day.